Hey, what's up everyone? So today's video is actually a video series that I did for Make Media um, a few years back and it's on building an Arduino based neural network robot and I'm really proud of the series and now that Maker Media no longer exists then I figured I would compile all three versions put them into one video and post them to my own channel so I really think this is a great video series and I think you'll enjoy it so if you haven't seen it before check it out. Let's go. So this week's going to be a little bit different than the videos on my channel. I'm going to be doing a detailed process on designing your own Arduino-based robot. But not just any robot. This robot's going to run on a neural network. It's going to be pretty cool. I'm going to go through the design steps of prototyping, making the circuit board and the schematics, ordering it and then assembling it, and then finally we'll program it. You'll see all the steps and hopefully you'll be able to make your own at the end. So with that said, let's gather up some components and let's get started. Okay, so these are the basic components we need to get the robot kind of tested beforehand, before we start making any schematics. You want to make sure that the pinouts are going to work, you know, even though you can read the documentation, you just want to make sure that everything's going to work before you start making the circuit board. So, you've got uh, an Arduino, this is actually um, a SAMD21 spark fun board. This is the microcontroller that I like to use. These are some uh, photoresistors for detecting the light. Two motors, we'll probably only have to test one. This is a motor driver, uh, it's the DRV8835 I believe. This is a little board from Palulu. Of course a battery, wheels, and I may put an OLED screen on it. So it will display some information when the robot is doing things. So I'm gonna connect all this stuff to a breadboard and then we can kind of test it out before you know we make any schematics. And when we're making the schematics, we can refer to this and we can also change some pins if it makes it easier to connect them. You'll see later on when we're working on it. Okay, now that I have all the jumpers connected to the Arduino and to the components, I just need to write a quick Arduino program and test out everything and make sure that it all works. So writing programs like this can be really helpful for later on. You can define all your pinouts and you can test them out and you can save all those for when you're designing the program later on. You can just copy and paste them over. It's especially helpful if you're working with motors because sometimes microcontrollers, especially using um, like Arduino, you could have pins that behave weirdly in certain situations like when you plug it in and you don't want the motors to spin when you first plug it in you only want them to react when the program tells them to so this is a time when you can test all that so I wrote a simple program that uh, just tests all the photo cells and the motor driver and then it also displays it to the OLED display so each one of the photo cells outputs how much light they're seeing on the OLED screen and then the motor is controlled by this one here and it will speed up and slow down depending on how much light we have. So now I can see that everything works. I can go on and I can transfer this physical schematic into an actual one in KiCad and I'll show you how to do that. So the nice thing about using you know that module like the motor driver from Palulu and the SparkFun board is that they have their schematics available. That means you can integrate them into your own even though Palulu's is just a PDF and SparkFun is in Eagle, not KiCad, you can still use them to reference and you can use them to create your own schematics. And you don't have to go digging through the documentation for, say, that motor driver just to see how it needs to be set up because you can kind of copy what others have done already and you know that it works and you've also tested it. That's the point of these boards and Arduinos and everything is that you can test your designs before you make your own custom circuit board. So 
So now that the schematics are done and we're about to begin designing the actual PCB and the traces and doing all that stuff, I like to design the board in some CAD software first and lay out some of the things like the motors, where the screen's going to be, where the buttons are going to be, and the actual outline of the circuit board. The reason for this is it makes it a lot easier to import the board outline into KiCad if you have a DXF file of it already. And a lot of CAD software, most CAD software, allows you to export DXFs. Now when you first open up KiCad to start the PCB design process, I import the DXF file and then from there I then import all the components which when you first open it, it's going to be a big mess of wires. So the first thing I like to do is separate the components into the groups of things they're connected to. So the capacitors that are connected to the microcontroller or the group of things that in, is involved with charging the battery or the photoresistors with their resistor. I like to separate them all so that they're isolated so that you can kind of create smaller tight packages of components before you actually place them on the board. You'll probably have to move them around but this is the way I do it just to start off. Once I have pretty much all the components on the board then I will start to route the components that are the most sensitive uh, and require the direct line of communication. So say the OLED display, um, you know, the clock line or something like that, you don't want interference on those because it could mess with it. It's really unlikely and you could probably just route them however you want, but that's just the way I do it. It just gives myself a starting point. So, and generally the last thing I do is the power lines. Take your time, work away at it, and slowly you get everything on. We'll be good to set all the traces and then we'll be able to send this board design off to some PCB manufacturing place and we'll go from there. All right, so the design is done. That's step one to this whole thing. So I'm gonna send this off to a PCB manufacturer and we should get it back in maybe a week or so. We'll continue on. So one of the things I like to do after I finish it is load it up, which KiCad has a mode called 3D Viewer, which lets you view the PCB in 3D. And this lets me know if some components are gonna be weird to install or things are gonna bump into each other. Just gives you another viewpoint of what the board could look like when it's finished, it's really helpful. So with that, that's part one down. We'll get these boards, we'll get the components, put it all together, and we'll have our assembled robot next video. So stay tuned, subscribe, check out my channel. You Maybe you'll see some things you like there. And yeah, everyone be good and have a good night. Hey everyone, my name is Sean Hodgins and welcome back to the multi-part series on building your own Arduino based neural network robot. So last week we explored early development stages so we prototyped some components using an Arduino, some motors, made sure everything worked, then wrote a program to make sure that everything worked together. We also created a schematic and a custom circuit board and sent that off to be made. Well. They're here now, and we've got all the parts to assemble it. So I'm gonna go through the steps of putting the surface mount components on this, the through hole components, finally putting a bootloader on it, and putting some firmware on it and testing it out. So, let's get to it. So I mentioned that I already have the components for the board ordered. You're more than likely going to order the components from DigiKey, which will have everything that you need. So within KiCad, there are a number of uh, exporters, custom ones that will extract the parts and put them into a CSV file. If this is your first project, I suggest putting each part manually. Um, 
just from the bomb in DigiKey, so going through and searching for each part. Say you search for the microcontroller, the SAM D21. When you add the part to your cart, and you add, you want to put in the customer reference the name that you used on the circuit board. So in this case, it's U2, and it will say this in the KiCad bomb. And when this component arrives from DigiKey, it's going to say U2 here. So it'll make everything a lot easier when you're assembling the board. A lot of people forget to do this the first time around and it will cause a lot of headache. So the next thing that I like to do, as you saw me doing in the intro, is separate the components from the discrete components to the more complex, the uh, ICs, the microcontroller, um, LEDs, anything in these silver anti-static bags. I will separate them out and then also the surface mount components I'll separate out because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be installing all the resistors and the capacitors first all the surface mount ones the second set of surface mount things will be the ICs like the microcontroller and the motor driver and then once you reflow these if you're doing it in an oven afterwards you can put all the through hole components on and this is just the way I do it uh, and it makes sense to have the capacitors on the board before just to eliminate any possible chances of ESD but it's never personally happened to me I've never fried a Arduino with ESD so I'm not even sure it's possible now again this is where you have a few options the solder paste so for most cases I like to order a stencil for the board because they're actually really cheap there's a lot of stencil services that you can get them done but if I'm only doing a couple of boards, in this case one or two, then I'm just going to do it by hand by using a very fine tip on the solder syringe. What I'm going to do is on each pad where there's a surface mount component I'm going to apply a little bit of solder and this is going to take a lot of trial and error you're going to end up putting too much solder almost all the time, especially when you have really small pins. You'll find that less is often more, but Again, trial and error, and you're going to see how to fix it afterwards because you're definitely going to have bridges no matter what if you don't use a stencil. Even when you use a stencil, you often have a couple. So, trial and error. Let's get going. So I've got all of the solder paste on the board now for the components that I'm going to be doing. This will be a good example of when you have too much solder paste, especially notice on the microcontroller. So we're going to have to clean that up for sure um, after with the soldering iron, but generally you have to anyway, so that's another technique you're going to have to learn. And with the really small pads on the motor driver, I actually used a little piece of solid core wire and just took some solder paste on the tip of it and spread it out. And you notice you don't need to go on each individual pins, you can go along them because when the solder paste heats up, it actually spreads out anyways. It spreads out on its own, so you can go between them as long as there's solder paste touching the pin and there's solder paste touching the pad, you should be good. The next thing you're really gonna wanna have is a really good pair of tweezers. So these will make your life so much better when dealing with really small resistors and components because they'll let you grab onto them so much easier. Okay, we've got all the components on, so we're ready to reflow it. It's really simple. Just pick it up carefully, put it kind of near the front. So this is honestly the cheapest toaster oven I could find. It was like $20. You don't need anything fancy, though it is nice to have one that has a fan in it. This one doesn't. Anyways, close it up. It's set to as hot as it can go. And we'll just turn it on and watch it. So just wait for it to reflow. You visually watch it reflow 
and then I like to leave it in there for like another five or ten seconds after everything has flowed. Also I like to have a little fan going for when I open it and also something that you can put the hot surface on. Normally I put it on like a heat sink or something. And some needle nose pliers. Looks like everything is done. And then once I'm sure everything is solid, get up. And there it is. Some components have obviously shifted around because we've used too much solder paste, which is normally the case. It's rare that you get a perfect board, though it does happen. So we're going to use the soldering iron to fix all these. The idea here is you're going to take your flux and wherever you need to move a component, you're going to apply some flux to that solder pad. So if you've got a resistor that's slightly off and it's only on one of the pads, you don't need to fix the ones that are like crooked but they're still connected, but if it's only connected to one pad then you're going to apply the solder paste to the side that is connected and then you'll heat that side while grabbing onto the, whatever you're moving, in this case a resistor, and it's going to come free. And then you can move it over so that it's touching both pads, like so. And now it's only connected on the one side. You add a little bit more flux on the other side and just touch it like that and it's connected. So that one has moved and it's fixed. Now since we use a lot of solder paste on the board, there's a lot of bridge pins on the microcontroller. The way to fix it is to take a dry soldering iron, which means there's no solder on the end, apply a bit of flux to where the bridge is and then it will naturally wick the extra solder up and leave just two pins with a little bit of solder remaining but now they're separated. It works really well and it's really simple once you understand that the soldering iron wants to wick the solder away from the pins. So every time it gets too full you have to then clean it off again with the brass sponge or else it won't be able to pull any more solder away. So that's the easiest way to get the pins from stop being bridged together. Now that we've fixed all the surface mount component problems, we can move on and install all the through hole components. So now that all the components are soldered on, I actually realized that the mounts that hold these are fuse holders but they weren't ordered for some reason, so that happens. So I'm going to make some ones that you can 3D print, and those files will be available in the GitHub as well. So I'm going to 3D print the motor mounts, we'll get those mounted on, we'll get the bootloader put on, and we're rocking. Okay, we just have one last step to do before we can load some firmware on it, and that's to load a bootloader on the chip. So what the bootloader allows you to do is program it using the Arduino IDE. It enables the USB so that you can plug it into your computer and use the SAMD driver to be detected as a, a COM port. So since we used the SparkFun SAMD board to test it, we might as well use that bootloader to put it on. So what I'm using to program it the first time is called an Atmel ICE but you can also use an Arduino itself to do it so you just plug this into USB and then we connect this cable and also the device does not 
power the chip itself, you have to give it a power supply, so we'll attach the battery. Green light means we're good. So now I'm going to open up Atmel Studio. Uh, I'm using Atmel Studio 7. It's free to download, of course. And we're going to go Tools, Device Programming, and see we're using the Atmel ICE. So you hit Apply, which enables that programmer. Then Read to make sure you can see. Now you don't really know if this is okay, but if anything shows up, it's probably fine. Next, you go to Memories. And we have to locate the SparkFun bootloader. So what you're going to do is percent at data, which brings you here, but you actually want to go one back. And go to local, Arduino, and packages, SparkFun, hardware, SAMD, whatever version is there, bootloaders, zero, and here it is, SparkFun SAMD.dev dot hex. So that is our bootloader. And you find that simple as hitting program. And if everything works, you get that. And that is it. It's now programmed. So we're going to connect it to USB. We're going to write some firmware. And we're going to test out the robot. Okay, so everything assembled. We got the battery hooked up. Got the OLED screen on there. Got it connected. And we're going to run the test program that we made originally. So all we have to do is hit upload on this. Hopefully the motors do something and then we're good. Programming. Alright. That's what it's supposed to do. So it programs. That's all we need. And that is it for this segment, which is assembling the neural network robot. So stay tuned for part three, where we'll be discussing neural networks. We'll be talking about running neural networks on Arduinos. It's totally possible. I've done it before. We'll be installing a neural network on this robot so it can navigate using one. And the whole project will be open source, so anyone can download it and make their own circuit board and do the whole thing and assemble it. That is the whole point. So be sure to subscribe, hit that like button, and also check out my channel where I do a whole bunch of projects that are like this as well. Anyways, everyone, you know the deal. Be good and have a good night. Hey everyone, my name is Sean Hodgins and welcome back to this multi-part series on building your own Arduino-based neural network robot. In the first part, we took off-the-shelf components and built a custom prototype, and then we designed a custom circuit board. In the second part, we took that custom circuit board, added surface mount components, through-hole components, a bootloader, and then some firmware just to test it out. And now, finally, we'll be installing the neural network firmware and talking about it and making sure you understand how it all works. Let's get to it. So before we develop the neural network program, I've put together a really simple navigation program using the light sensors, but no neural network, just the light sensors controlling the motor. And I will break this program down so you can understand what's happening in each section. It uses the U8G2 library for the screen, that's what that's for. Um, this include make logo is the very beginning make logo screen, that's all that does. And this enables the OLED. So all that stuff is just for the display. Then you've got photo sensors and then the, the motor outputs and the buttons. And then here this is defining the analog inputs for those photo sensors and uh, enabling the buttons here. More OLED definitions and then this is how the first uh, logo is set up. You can look into that library. It's pretty simple once you understand it. That's just the setup, and then you can see here in the loop, it's just uh, depending on what menu case is running, then it'll run that. So simple light avoid. That's the program that will make the robot navigate avoiding light, hopefully. In this simple light avoid routine, it reads from the four sensors, then it maps them from 
you get a value from 0 to 1024 depending on how much light but then it switches them from 400 because I find they still get light to 0 to 48 for the uh, for the top sensor and the bottom sensor and then from 0 to 64 for the left sensor and the right sensor it takes those values and it feeds them into something called draw ball dir so it's drawing the ball direction on the OLED screen so what this does is it takes those four inputs and then it defines them in an X and Y coordinates based on how much more light each sensor has. So if the left one has more light than the right one, then the ball slightly goes to the left. And if the top one has more light than the bottom one, then the ball is going to move to the bottom one. It's kind of like a joystick on the screen, and that's what's controlling the robot. So once you have those X and Ys, those are actually sent to the motor control. Well, this is to draw that ball on the screen and this is the motor control that will drive the two motors. So if we see in this motor control subroutine I've defined the motors that 50 is not moving, 0 is completely backwards as fast as it can and 100 is completely forwards as fast as it can. So what it does is it takes, or it takes the Y offset and sets that as how much power each motor has and then it takes the X offset so the uh, X coordinate the left and right sensors and then offsets that power from one motor to the other if it's fully to the back sensor then it, they would both drive straight at full power but if they're slightly more to the right then it would make it move to the left so it takes that offset sends it in and then finally motor A and B uh, this is how you can control them. So you have a motor routine A where it takes the speed between 0 and 100, 50 being not moving, 0 being backwards, 100 being forwards, and that's how it defines it here. This is how it controls the motor driver. So it changes the, the phase of the input and then gives it a PWM input depending on which direction it chooses. There's a hundred ways you could do this, probably a lot of ways you could do it better than I've done it, this is what works. So it just keeps doing that over and over and over again. So let's see how that works. So you can see I've made a little menu here, but there's only one program on it. You can switch between them using the left button, but the other two just say blank. Anyways, if you go to the simple program, hit the right button to run it. Then now we have a ball in the middle. Now the motors aren't connected at the moment. They're uh, They've only got power when you have this switch that moves over. That puts power to the system from the battery, and they're powered through the battery. As you can see, it's pretty dead even right now because they all have the same amount of light. It might be a little bit to the left here because there's a little bit of a shadow on this one. If I put the shadow over this, then the ball moves up to the top. If I put the shadow over the back, then the ball moves back. And if you can imagine that being like a joystick, then you can see that it's going to make the robot move in those directions. So let's test it out. So now the motors are connected to the power source. We'll run the program. So as you can see, it's trying to stay in the shadow. But one thing we could implement is have it drive forward when it's fully in light. Let's add that right now. Okay, so what I just added is if the sum of all of the sensors is greater than a value, which would seem like they're all being lit, or it's not in a the shadow, then it's told to just drive forward slowly until that's not the case anymore. So now we can see it's happy when it's in a shadow, not happy when it's not in a shadow. And it looks for the shadow as well. So as you can see, that program works really well and it's pretty simple. It doesn't take that many lines of code to get the robot behaving the way you want it to. But it's not as cool as a neural network, and what's cool about a neural network is we can define certain extremes, and then it can work out 
the points in the middle on its own. So let's develop the neural network program now. So for the neural network, we're actually going to be adapting code that is found on the website robotics.hobbyscene.com. They have an Arduino artificial neural network, a really great example code that is actually designed to it's designed to take a seven segment input and translate it into only four bits. So you're taking seven bits and converting them down to four. It's a really cool, interesting program. But what we're going to be doing is we're going to take this set of code that they have, because they've developed all the math behind it, and then we're going to modify it so that it can run on the sensor inputs and then output to the motors. So we're going to be defining, we're going to be having this run continuously after it's trained to control the robot. It's pretty cool. So again, with this program written and everything modified, let's go through it and I'll explain everything again and we'll just make sure you're familiar with everything that's happening within the program. We've gone over some of this stuff with uh, the inputs, they're all the same. Now we have some variables that are for the neural network. We're going to define the extremes of the program. So the lights, the extremes of the inputs are going to be defined between 0 and 1 and 1 being the most possible light on that sensor and 0 being the least possible light on that sensor. So here are the inputs. So here we have a matrix of 4 inputs by 16. So each one of these is the sensor input and we're defining these now as the maximums. So as you can see I've labeled them here on the right. So with this one, 0, 1, 1, 0, that means there's fully light on one on the left and right, but no light on the top and the bottom sensors. And we go through every possible scenario that we can think of that will allow it to properly learn how to behave. Because we're going to correlate these with motor functions. And you don't actually need this many. You can experiment with removing some and then seeing how the robot behaves and how the behavior adapts to not having as many inputs. But this is what we're using. We've got 16 of the inputs and these are the correlating outputs. Now as I mentioned before we gave the motors a value between 0 and 100. So now we've mapped that down to between 0 and 1 and these are the outputs to the motor. So when the left light is on and the right light has full light then the motors are going to move. We're going to give the motors a value of 75 to drive forward but not super fast and as you can see each one of these scenarios is kind of broken down if there's light on the left then have slightly more power in the left motor and the right motor stationary and then if we have light on the top left and the right then we want the robot to drive backwards so right now all we're doing is defining the extreme cases because we have all these extreme cases defined there's going to be situations where they're not all fully light and not fully light. In fact, it's almost never going to happen. But what the neural network is going to do is going to define an equation that determines what the output of the motor should be and fill in all the gaps between all of these extremes. And that's what's interesting about a neural network is that it can learn and adapt different scenarios just by training at these specific extremes. Up here we have uh, some variables that I should explain. Pattern count, that's just the number of patterns possible for the training. Input nodes, we know we have four sensors. So we have four input nodes. Hidden nodes, it's kind of up in the air what you should do, but I always just do input nodes plus one uh, and that seems to work for now. And you can always play around with these and see how it affects how long it trains, anything like that, because the training can take a while. Output nodes, we know we have two motors, so we have two outputs. Learning rate, that's the amount it's allowed to modify the weights between the nodes in the neural network. So the nodes are the inputs, the hidden layer, and the outputs. Each one of the neurons is, con is called a node. And what you're doing is modifying the weights between them that are trying to get the output. So what's happening when you're training is you're taking you're taking the predefined outputs and the predefined inputs, as I showed you, and developing basically a very complex equation to make those two equal on inside of the equation. So 
it's going to go through all the training inputs and the outputs and make sure that they all work and they're very close to what they need to be. They're not going to be exactly 0.75 for the outputs if we tell it that, but it's going to try to get as close as possible. So it's going to modif it's going to start with a random set of weights between each connection and then it's going to modify these weights every every iteration of the neural network. So the learning rate is how much it's allowed to change those weights. And if it's too high, you will constantly have an increasing error or never find the proper equation. And if it's too low, it could take forever. And if it takes forever, it'll give up as well. And then finally, success is the mean square error, which is the, basically it's trying to see how many, how close it is to the inputs equaling the outputs. And that's kind of how you define when a neural network is trained. So once the success gets below the mean square error of this 0 0.0009, then we consider it trained and it should be able to operate properly. But you could increase this and see if it works, and you could decrease it to see if it works even better. It's not necessarily the perfect number here, but you need to play around with it and see what happens. So this is all part of the program that we took from Hobbyzine website. So they explain it very well there, but basically it's a program that is checking. This is the training subroutine, train neural network. And this is basically their code that trains the neural network. What it does is it checks each time the error and then it modifies the weight slightly and it sees which direction it should increase or decrease the weights between each node. So all these are, are iterations for each node between the hidden layer and the output layer. And it does this iteratively and that's what takes so much time and that's why parallel operations on neural networks work really well. That's why GPUs are used for neural networks because it can do a lot of small calculations at the same time. So the Arduino has to do each one of these on its own in each routine which takes a while. And you can see it takes about three to five minutes. So it's checking each time and this report every thousand I actually changed it to report every 100 and what this does is it outputs to the graph every hundred iterations of node changes to see what the error is. And once the error gets below that threshold that we just, just we define, the 0 0.0009, then it stops training, it's done. And all the weights have been saved in the neural network. So now that it's been trained, we can select the drive neural network function, subroutine. What this is gonna do is it makes sure that it has been trained. If not, it won't let you run it. And now, Instead of the training set that we use, it's going to use our light sensors as inputs. So again, we read the light sensors. We This time we map the light sensors to between 0 and 100 because it's an integer, and then we convert it into a float between 0 and 1. And those are now our neural network inputs. So we've got this routine, input to output, and it takes the four inputs that we just measured, physically measured from the robot, these four inputs are entered in, uses those inputs with the neural network and the weights to determine the outputs, and that is the output that you get from the neural network. And the outputs are the motor control. We end up with the outputs, with two outputs from the neural network. That gives us a value between 0 and 100. And then all we do is send those the same way we did before to the motors, and then because of that, the motors will be driven. And it will constantly refer back to the neural network and it will constantly give you outputs. So let's train this neural network and then we'll run it and see how differently it behaves than the other way. We've got two more items on the menu. So we've got simple, which is the one we ran before, which is still in this program. We've got train neural network and run neural network. Before we can run it, we have to train it. So when we do this, you'll see this will light up and the graph and the graph will give you every time a hundred iterations goes through, the graph is going to display the mean square error. And it's going to make sort of a logarithmic curve as it gets closer to the value that we need. 
Okay, so now that it's trained, let's uh, make the room really dark and we can see if we can chase it around with a flashlight and see how it behaves. So, that'll be cool. So, all of these motor decisions are taking place based on the training data. So, it works. Yeah, it works pretty well. It's trying to avoid the light and find places of shadows. Now, if we were to train it again, it may behave differently. Because each time you train it, the equation that maps the inputs to the outputs is slightly different because the beginning is random. So that's what's really cool about neural networks. Now you can also experiment with, like I said, removing some of the training inputs, have larger gaps between the extremes so that the behavior could be more erratic or uh, it doesn't actually want to avoid shadows. It could just drive around in circles. You know, anything could happen because it'll be less defined about the different amounts of light it could see. So why don't we try that again with the simple program and we can see how that behaves in the shadow. You can see that the behavior is similar to the last neural network training. Now as you can see, a neural network is not exactly necessary in this specific type of robot. We were able to design a simple program that almost behaved the same way. But the interesting thing is to see the different behaviors that happen each time you train it. And also that you're not specifically giving it every scenario, but that it's defining the scenarios between the extremes within the neural network. And I think that's really cool. And you can adapt this to all different types of applications, and it's just a great tool to experiment with neural networks and see how they work. And you realize that they're not that complicated. They're basically an equation that is defining one set of parameters to equal another set of parameters. That's what a neural network does. So if you enjoyed this project and you want to build one yourself, head over to the GitHub. There, you'll find all the files needed to recreate the entire thing. It's fully open source. If you like this video series, hit that like button. And if you have an idea for something you want to see done in the future, leave a comment below, because I might be able to make it happen. If you want to check out my channel, I've got all types of projects that are fully open source, similar to this, they're pretty cool, you might enjoy it. Anyways, everyone, you know the deal. Be good and have a good day. Oh, we lost a wheel.